When I left you last in our exciting saga of econometrics, we had finished chapter 10. Chapter 10 was the one with the silly name, heteroscedasticity. The next thing I want to talk about is actually in chapter 12. You may be thinking, why are you skipping chapter 11? Well, there's no homework in it, all right? So there's, there's no new topics, but oh my God, it's a brilliant chapter. So I, I do want to say a few words about it here to start with. And the title of chapter 11 is Running Your Own Regression Project, okay? Um, and if you're thinking of doing a regression project for another class, or maybe you're going to do a, a, a senior thesis or whatever, man, there is no better place to start than chapter 11. Let, let me tell you what he, what he has here. I'll just kind of read through it rather than, uh, 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 there's not going to be anything technical here. First is choosing your topic. So he's got the a page and a half just on choosing your topic. He's got some journals you could look at to get some ideas. Collecting your data. Oh man, that could be a royal pain. So he goes through the whole process of what you have to do to, to collect the data. What data to look for. Where to look for economic data. And what do you do if you have missing data? And then there's some advanced data sources. So it's really, really well done. Um, then after this, he has some practical advice for your project, which is on page 348. What to check if you get an, an unexpected sign, which we talked about in the omitted variable bias stuff. Uh, and a dozen practical tips worth reiterating on page 350. Check this out. I'm telling you, it's an expensive book, but this guy does a great job. Don't try to maximize adjusted R square. Always review the literature and hypothesize science before estimating the model, and on and on and on. So you haven't got to think to yourself, all right, well, I'm going to do this regression project. I guess I better reread uh, my Studeman book starting with chapter one. No, start with chapter 11. And he's going to reference here, and I'm sure you saw that, he's actually referencing the chapter where you would look that up again. In general, a one-sided test is uh, unless they expect the sign of the coefficient is actually in doubt. Chapter 5, all right? So, very, very well done. Then I mentioned this, I believe, at the end of the last chapter. I can't remember now. But the ethical econometrician. Oops, sorry. This way. The ethical econometrician. He has a section there on don't run 10,000 regressions and then just, you know, display the one that actually worked. And you're thinking, well, that's great. That's a great chapter. This was well worth $3,000 or however much the book was. But wait, there's more. Writing your research report, he then goes through and tells you, okay, your first part ought to be this, your second part ought to be this, your third part ought to be that. Um, so he lays out an outline for what a paper that is using econometrics uh, should look like. And then, I think, is this the last bit I wanted to show you? Yeah. And then he has a summary of the entire book on pages 354 to 356. And I always tell students on the final exam, uh, have this page marked here for yourself. It's, it's, it's a, it would, if we were doing a regular semester, it would be an in-class final, but open book. Uh, so be sure you have this one marked. Let me show you why. Um, he starts off over here with various items on, uh, you know, what's the symbol for, uh, how do you, uh, what's the coefficient of determination, what's the adjusted for degrees of freedom mean. So kind of definitional stuff on these couple of pages right here. What's the Durbin-Watson statistic? What's the standard error and so forth. But then on the next page, what he's got, check this out. What can go wrong? What are the consequences? How can it be detected? How can it be corrected? A whole page of this, all right? So extremely useful. Uh, I know I keep saying this over and over, but I have never seen another book that does this uh, nearly as well as he does. And as I believe I mentioned in an earlier uh, video, uh, there's this famous um, economist who uh, does a lot of critiques of how economists do econometrics. And she said, the only book that does it right is this book, right? Now, of course, she said that about 15, 20 years ago, so whether or not somebody else has copied since then, I don't know. Uh, but um, nevertheless, a resounding endorsement for your textbook. Okay, so that's chapter 11. Uh, we're skipping it in a way, um, but it's an extremely useful chapter and a really good one to use to uh, uh, reference during the final exam.
All right, chapter 12. Now, this is a topic that uh, I didn't get covered when I was in grad school. It wasn't, uh, I don't remember it anyway, uh, wasn't a real big deal back then, but it's become a really big deal. And so I definitely wanted to cover this so you knew how to do it yourself. When you're doing a time series uh, regression, you need to see whether or not the dependent and independent variables are stationary. Because if they are not stationary, then you cannot trust the uh, statistical inferences that you are making about the data. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's see. Different time series. Uh, yeah. Uh, what you want is you want to have, whether it be a dependent variable or any one of the independent variables, either way, and again, this is a time series issue, all right? Uh, and as I mentioned in, in earlier uh, videos, I'm really a time series guy, so I, I don't really do any cross-sectional stuff, so this is something that I think is particularly important because you should do this every time you do a time series uh, analysis. You should check each variable for stationarity. All right, here's what it means. It means that they must have a constant, uh, constant mean and a constant variance. Um, that it shouldn't matter when you select this, uh, like let's say you're looking at uh, US GDP since 1946, all right, uh, to today. And you're looking at 10 year chunks, those are your samples here. The, the mean should be just about the same regardless of what years you pick out. Uh, otherwise, if the mean is changing over time, then again, your statistical tables are based on the idea that the mean stays constant. For example, let me go back to my, my uh, huge oil barrel full of red and blue marbles. All right, so you've got this huge oil barrel full of red and blue marbles. Uh, that's the population. And you are sampling that population by taking a measuring cup and dipping it in and then going over and counting out the red and blue to try to figure out, I wonder what the ratio of red to blue is in the barrel. Well, I don't have time to count the whole barrel. I'm going to take a sample. And if you remember from an earlier video, of course, the bigger sample you get, the more likely it is to be accurate. But, you know, let's, let's say that your technological resources are such that you can only get as much as you can get into a measuring cup. It shouldn't matter whether you dip that cup in today or last week or the month before if the average, if the ratio of red to blue has stayed the same over that entire period, right? That's what we're after here. We're after, uh, it shouldn't matter when you dip it in. If the, the statistical tables are built based on the assumption that we are not continuously changing the ratio of red to blue. What if somebody is every once in a while sneaking in at night and pouring some extra blue ones in? Well, now it matters when you sample it, all right? Now it matters, and so it doesn't have a constant mean. Uh, and so that's the problem we're talking about here. And why is it a problem? All right, uh, I gave you the example of, of GDP a minute ago, and uh, that's a particular sore point for this because you know, I guess in the book, do I have that example here? I like his example in the book where he says, hey, check this out. This Y and X are, are highly correlated. They got a real good adjusted R square. And the Y turns out to be, and I may have this backwards, but I believe this is right. The Y turns out to be tuition at his university and the X turns out to be the price of gas in Portland, Oregon. So but there's really no logical reason to believe those would be correlated, but the sample he selected intentionally was the 1970s and uh, you know, up to about the mid 80s when we had really high inflation. And when we had really high inflation, what's tuition at his university doing? What are gas prices doing? So they're both doing this. So when you put these data into the computer, they're like, whoa, yeah, this is really highly. It turns out that, that gas prices in Portland, Oregon really do have a huge impact on tuition at uh, Occidental University. Or, um, and they don't, right? They don't. But because the mean, the average gas price and the average tuition are both going up at the same time, it appears as if there's a relationship between the two when there's not. Uh, there's a spurious regression, there, uh, a correlation. There is a correlation, but it's because they're mutually caused by something else. It's not because they actually have a relationship. All right, so let me say that again. Um, in a, uh, and I had to do that. Where's, where's my uh, regression results here? 
I had to do that with this, all right? I had to go through and check all of the variables in that paper I've been showing you to see if they were stationary, to see if they had a problem of, uh, 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 you know, during one period, uh, the, you know, the average was so-and-so, and during the next one, the average was so-and-so. Uh, then, and, and obviously, one observation in the next is going to be different, but I'm, I mean, you know, sort of a chunk of variables, do they tend to have the same average over time? Now, let me show you here if we've got... Oh, and by the way, uh, this can also be a problem not with just the dependent and independent variable, but also with the error term. Uh, it could turn out that the error term doesn't have the same distribution uh, over time. Its mean is going to be zero, presumably. Uh, I mean, if it's not, then the, then the um, uh, intercept uh, adjusts for it. But remember the last chapter, chapter 10, was all about the fact that what do we do if the error term does not have the same variance over time? Where's my example here? Oh, maybe I just drew it and didn't have an actual graph out of the book. No, no, here's one, here's one. Yeah, okay. Remember this from the previous chapter. There are the error terms of the residuals. Actually, I guess it, you got error terms or residuals on there. Yeah, this is the, these are the residuals. Um, they, are not, they do not have a constant variance over time. Uh, that was called heteroscedasticity, uh, and we've already dealt with that, so we're not going to worry about that here in this chapter. Um, we're just going to talk about the dependent and independent variable not having a constant mean uh, and a constant um, variance. All right, so and I've told you why that's a problem, because the regression analysis will assume there's a relationship when there's not, because basically, for example, in the 70s, all prices are going up, all right? So, you know, uh, th it means that all of the averages are going up over time, and so therefore what you think is a statistical relationship because this is perhaps a causal factor in this is really just because they're both going up because the OPEC uh, did a... Um, uh, Oil embargo. All right, I said that, said that, said that. Okay, detecting non-stationarity. So how do you test for this, all right? Uh, and it, this is really interesting. Um, all right, let me give you the example of, again, you should do this. Anytime you do a time series analysis, you should check the variables for stationarity, all right? So how do you test for this? Well, let's say, and what does he use here? A... Uh, relationship here, let's say we're, we're testing y sub t for stationarity. y sub t minus 1 plus v sub t. All right. Yeah, and I can't remember what Greek letter that is. Uh, but anyway, that, that's a fancy Greek letter he uses in the book. Um, the, what we are hoping this is, a, this is a random error term. This is your observation from, say, uh, February. And this is your observation from January. Or this is your observation from 1979, this is your observation from 1978, or your uh, second quarter and first quarter, whatever, right? Uh, you're hoping that those variables are not correlated with each other. You're hoping that there's not an underlying trend that could thereby uh, cause the uh, mean to rise or fall uh, over time. So, what you're hoping is that the absolute value of that, it, I'm sorry, uh, less than one, less than one, because we're testing for a unit root here in a minute, less than one, right? You're hoping that it's less than one, because as I'm going to demonstrate in just a moment, uh, this will cause the variation in the mean to stay constant over time. I, I have a little spreadsheet program I, I uh, put together real quick to, to demonstrate this. Um, if that is greater than one, okay, I should write this over here, then it's stationary. And obviously, this is something easy to calculate, right? You can run a regression with this. You can run a regression with y sub t as a function of y sub t minus 1 and see what that coefficient is right there. We're not going to do exactly that. Um, we're going to use a, a, a Dickey-Fuller test, but that's essentially what it does, right? Uh, so it's trying to see what that variable is right there. Is there any relationship between these two right here? Does, does, the, does the direction of this 
tend to determine the direction of this, because if so, that's a bad thing, right? Because now we don't have stationary data anymore. Uh, this is non-stationary. And also it would be even if it were equal to 1. In these two cases down here, what you would tend to see if you plotted out this variable over time what you would tend to see is something like this let's say it's a uh, uh, one or some yeah, positive number well it could be a, it could be a negative number going down this way because it's the absolute value but These are not the error terms, these are the actual observations. And as you can see, it matters tremendously whether you happen to look at this subset of the data versus this subset of the data, what the mean of those observations is going to be. The mean is increasing over time, or we could have done it the other way, where the mean is decreasing over time. And this is going to happen, that sort of thing is going to happen whenever this, the, the absolute value of that is equal to 1 or greater than 1. And again, I'm going to show you that here in just a second uh, on the spreadsheet. Um, whereas, this one up here, let's use horn frog purple for that one. Time y. Then, here's our average y. The observations look like that. And as a consequence, you can see that, yeah, as a consequence, it doesn't matter whether you pull from this part or pull from this part. It's still the same mean. Uh, it's also the same variance, but, but uh, um, I'm not going to emphasize that so much here. Because uh, the mean, it, it, you get an easier uh, intuitive feel for what we're talking about here with the mean. The variance changing would be they'd be further apart from each other or closer together. Um, okay. So, let me prove this to you. Uh, it's very easy to write this up to show yourself, to show you that, yes, indeed, if this character right here, if this parameter right here is less than 1, it's going to look like this. But if this parameter is greater than 1, again, absolute value, uh, or equal to 1, then it's going to look like this. All right, so check this out. Let's see here. I've got to wake the computer back up. And... There we go, control, alt, delete, my password. Ooh, I bet you're watching me right now type in the password. But by the time this, oh no, you can't see my hands, all right. Um, okay, so what I did was, let, let me, well, no, let me leave it this size for now. Maybe, let me change the size of this chart here. Okay, uh, what I have done here is uh, I am plotting out this particular variable, all right? And this variable is x, all right? Oh, row, that's a row, all right? I've got it written down right here, row. Um, x, and what I've done is I, I made up the first x. I said the first x is going to be 0, all right? And then from then on, I added... All right, I told the computer to give me a random number. From plus 10 to minus 10. Just give me a random number from plus 10 to minus 10 for this right here. So that's what it's doing. And uh, make the new x equal to the last x times rho, which I'm going to vary from being less than 1 to uh, equal to 1 to greater than 1, times rho plus the random term. All right? Uh, and well, let me show you what it looks like if I put in a zero. What I did was, I've got, I don't know if you can see this part, I've got rho way up there at the top equal to 0 0.2, and then my random number, that where it says random, that's the v, and the x is the current observation of x. And like I said, I just, it, notice on the first one there, I said let's just start with zero. And so in the second period, it was zero plus nine, because it doesn't matter what rho is going to be, uh, if, if rho is equal to, I'm sorry, if, <coughs> if, if the second x is equal to the first x times rho plus the random number, but the first x is zero, it doesn't matter what the rho is. So the, 
the second observation is always going to be equal to whatever the random number the computer came up with was. So let, let, let's try rho as equal to zero. Here's the plot over here. And where's the mean? Ah, that's easy. The very first dot is right at zero. All right, so you can see where zero is right there. So let's put in rho as zero to where they're totally unrelated. And I'll show you what that looks like. And it's going to look almost exactly like what I just showed you. Right? So here's rho as zero. And as you can see, the value of x is just bouncing all over the place. Just, it looks just a whole lot like this. So it doesn't really matter where we select, which time period we select for this variable here. It's going to have the same mean. All right? And it also looks like it has the same variance, doesn't it? All right, well, let's make it not zero. Let's make it, you know, okay, but, but isn't this a problem if it's greater than zero but less than one? Uh, wouldn't that still cause a problem? Because it means they are related to one another. And no, it's not. Let me put in 0 0.5. Oops. 0.5. Okay. There's 0.5. It does the same thing, right? And you know why? Because... If this value is 10, then it's a half times 10, and so it's pulling it back towards zero, all right? When, when this number is less than one, then the computer, save for the random element, the, the uh, program is always pulling it back down towards zero, all right? It's, it's a, X is always a fraction of the previous X. Well, that means it's just going to get smaller. It's, if it bounces way up here, the next one's going to be down here, again, independent of the random element, which is, of course, going to be random. Uh, so that's the point they're making here, that, that even if there's a relationship that's, that's less than one, it's still, no problem. It still looks like this, all right? No problem. It's still going to look like that. Okay, this is going to be so cool. All right, I'm going to change it to one... And I'm serious, which is really sad, that I think this is really fun. Right. I'm going to put in 1. Okay. With 1, now you're starting to see, look, look, at, look at the very first observation was 0, right? And then it started getting, it started adding to itself. It drifted all the way up above 30 before it started drifting back down again. There's a definite trend that's taking place from that first observation to it looks like about the 15th or 20th that, that, that peaks over there. Uh, and so it starts to follow trends along here. And that's not what we want. Now it does matter. Think about if you took that, that first chunk there uh, from that first observation again to it looks like about the 20th one uh, and, and figured the average there versus the average way back here. It's going to be quite a bit different, and that's a problem, all right? So if this row is equal to 1, if, it has, if this process has a unit root, all right, so they call it a unit root, uh, then that's a problem. It is not stationary. And look what happens if we make it even bigger than 1. I'm going to make it 2. <laughs> okay. Uh, 2, um, it just explodes. It, 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 obviously, it's scaling it so uh, that the last observation is what? I can't even see what number that is because it's not showing up on the screen. Oh, I could just look down here. The last value was negative 1.6 to the 30th. All right, so uh, to the um, e to the 30th. Uh, and so the values are just exploding when it is greater than 1. Uh, let me make it 1.4. See if I get something. Man, that's, that's exploding too. 1.1. I mean, look, look what happens when it's greater than one. I mean, it's just taking off in the same direction because obviously, if this is five, then this is even greater than five. So this is greater than five. So this is even greater than greater than five. And also it just explodes, right? So, so that means that the data are not stationary, that, that it doesn't have the same mean in any significant chunk of time you select uh, over the sample period. And that's a problem, all right? So, let's see. That's how, uh, so we're going to try to detect. The, the uh, Dickey-Fuller test tries to see if the process has uh, basically one of these down here, but they say, well, we're looking for a unit root. We're trying to see, does it have this problem to where the values tend to follow each other and then explode? Uh, well, it had to explode, but just get bigger and bigger. All right, so, so you're going to do this Dickey-Fuller Dickey test, and you're going to hope that you find out 
that rho is significantly less than one. All right, that's what it's trying to do, is to see if it's significantly less than the absolute value of one. Um, I guess I'll show you this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we start with this again. Right? That's why I like this, that, that it's nice and uh, the, the test itself is so similar to this intuitive way to understand it that, that it's not that hard to follow. Again, you should do this with any time series. I had to do it with the paper I told you about. Um, and I discovered that the investment variable was not stationary, which is not unusual for a macro variable, even though I had it deflated because the economy grew over time. Um, you can put a trend variable in, but I hate doing that. I, I, I feel like it's boosting the adjusted R squared for no good reason, but that's my own personal philosophy. Uh, so, um, so I differenced it, which made it a lot harder to get high adjusted R squares. Uh, now, let's see, so we've got this uh, relationship right here. What the Dickey-Fuller test is going to do, and I don't believe I'll bother to show you all that, Okay, what it boils down to, uh, th these are equations 12.26 and 12.27, but essentially what we're doing We're checking to see if it's equal to 1, all right? Uh, we're checking to see if it has a unit root, which means it's non-stationary. So our null hypothesis is the bad thing. Uh, our null hypothesis is that it has a unit root and our um, uh, data series is uh, non-stationary. Which means we'll have to fix it. Uh, and so we want, this goes back to, remember in the, the, the um, what were we testing? I can't remember now in a previous chapter where we usually set up as the null hypothesis the thing we hope that isn't true. And we're back to that. There was one we did earlier where actually uh, the null hypothesis is what we hoped was true, so we set, sort of stacked things in our favor. But now we're stacking them against ourselves again. We are starting with the null hypothesis that it has a unit root and that it is not stationary. So we therefore hope to reject the null hypothesis. Now, um, you can test this three different ways. You can test it like this, and this is not, I'm, I'm fudging a little bit here, but, but it's, it's the right idea, because they do a little bit of a transformation of the data. Uh, you can test it like this. where you have an intercept, and you almost always include the intercept. For all the reasons mentioned in the, in the rest of the book, you almost always include the intercept. Or, how do they do the trend variable? Uh, we'll call this uh, uh, beta, I guess. Trend plus B sub T sub T. Yeah, uh, or you can, oh, I think I have this as a constant, uh, or, you or you can test uh, with a trend, which means that you include a variable that just does like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 uh, over time to take into account the fact that the economy is bigger over time. Um, I, I've got the paper right here. Let me see what I did. I don't even remember now. I only finished writing it a couple months ago, but I don't remember how which Dickey Fuller tests I used. I know I didn't do this. I don't think. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. Uh, let me look it up for you real quick. Uh, it's under JTH Research. It's under Active Projects. And it's under Keynes' Aggregate Investment Function. Here is the version I submitted to the journal. And Control H. Maximize this. It's in a table in the very back of the book, of the article. And what did I do? Is that it? I just skipped by something that was a table. No, 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 that's something else. Aha! I did these two. That's what I thought I did. I didn't do the one without an intercept because that's not a good idea because for all the reasons we talked about before, including an intercept helps solve other problems. Uh, and I discovered that two variables were not stationary uh, when you 
included the trend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, the others were, what's this last table I've got? Oh, okay. The Broish Godfrey. Okay. Uh, and I had the difference those, all right? So that I didn't have any choice. I had the difference them uh, because they weren't uh, stable over time. All right. Now, and I guess I've already just given you the uh, conclusion here. By the way, the Dickey-Fuller test uses a t-value, uses a t-test. As you can imagine, it's just a t-test. But, and I don't know why, uh, I didn't even do this in grad school, but if I had done, I wouldn't have remembered by now anyway. Um, but uh, I don't know why, but you use a different t-table. And he has this t-table in 12, table 12.1. So, and there is homework where you need to do a Dickey Fuller test, so you would use this table to do the uh, Dickey Fuller test. And the Y not growing and the Y uh, growing is the, the Y growing is the one that includes the trend, and the other one does not include the trend. Um, let's see. Now, the traditional way, let's say you discover you had a problem, like I did. I discovered my, I kind of suspected it would. Uh, my variable that I was trying to explain. Quarterly investment spending in the United States from 1954 to 2012, um, it was not stationary. The traditional way to deal with this is that I now make a new variable. Which is a difference to variable. The new variable that I'm testing now is t minus t minus 1. This is almost always stationary. The, the, the changes are almost always stationary, uh, even when the levels are not. So the problem is, of course, that as, as he says in the book, first differencing throws away information. Uh, the use of first differences should be considered carefully. And uh, um, let's see. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, it is possible that two non-stationary variables uh, may be co-integrated, all right? And I'm not going to go over this, I'm just going to mention it, but that they have a matching degree of non-stationarity so that when you look at them together, you might as well say they're stationary, all right? Uh, so that you don't have to, to, to correct for. I didn't have that luxury, so I corrected for it, and I did this right here, all right? So again, uh, it's a very simple idea, and that is that if your data series uh, doesn't have the same mean over time or the same variance over time, then the statistical inferences we are making are based on the idea that these things are constant. I mean, if you're going in, taking a sample out of that uh, uh, oil barrel every day, and let's say you do it one day for, for uh, um, you know, 12, uh, I'm sorry, for, for a month uh, in a row, and you're going to take the average of that, right? But at night, someone's dipping in some extra blue uh, marbles in there. Well, then your assumption that you can average these 30, 31 days of samples and get a sense of how much is in the barrel is not true because they keep changing the ratio of blue to red every day. So I can't take a sample every day and then average all those together because the different days have different averages. So we have to fix that. Now, um, let's see here. So the last part of this section here, oh, I'm a little bit over how long I usually go. Uh, well, I'm almost done here. Uh, the last section is, okay, here's what you should do in time series research. Specify the model. Test all the variables for unit roots using the appropriate Dickey-Fuller test. If they don't have unit roots, go ahead and estimate the regression. If they do, then uh, see if you have co-integration, all right, where you don't have to fix for it. Uh, if, they, if they're not co-integrated, though, then change the functional form to make sure that you don't have this, the, the uh, stationarity problem, non-stationarity problem anymore. Uh, and um, that's it. Thank you.